Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here today to talk to you about the posterior cervical laminectomy and fusion. This is a procedure done through the back of the neck to help relieve pressure off of your spinal cord and to realign the bones of your neck. If you have severe compression of your spinal cord, you may be experiencing symptoms such as balance and coordination problems or clumsiness with your hands. For more information on what the symptoms of severe spinal cord compression are, please see my educational video regarding cervical myelopathy found in the links below. There are many different ways to treat this particular condition, and you want to have a knowledgeable, experienced surgeon to help you make the best decision possible. The posterior cervical laminectomy infusion is one of those tools in my toolbox to help treat the condition of cervical myelopathy. In this video, we'll cover the normal neck anatomy as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure from beginning to end. At the end of this video, I'll be discussing risks, expected recovery, and any post-operative restrictions that we may have. If you want to skip around to different sections, please see the timestamps in the description below to find the parts of the video that most interest you. Now that we have an overview of the video, let's go ahead and get started. Now that we're in, let's start the discussion on the cervical laminectomy infusion. Before we get started though, we should have a little bit of an understanding of the basic anatomy of the cervical spine. This particular picture is a view from the back of your neck. Let's take a look at where these anatomic landmarks are one by one. The spinous process is going to be highlighted here in red. The spinous process is the bone that you can actually feel when you're touching the back of your neck. An extension of the spinous process that extends downward and covers your spinal cord is called the lamina, highlighted here in blue. The lateral mass is the outermost extension of the lamina, and it's what connects your bones together. There is no spinal cord where the lateral mass is. The spinal cord is only contained in the area that is covered by the lamina here in blue. The nerve roots are going to be highlighted here in black. Between each vertebrae, a set of nerve roots come out on the left and right side and go down your arm and upper back into very specific areas, which helps give you sensation, strength, and can also generate pain. Moving on, this is going to be a view from your side. So up top here, you're going to have where your skull and brain are, and down at the bottom is going to be where your feet are. Off to the left is going to be the front of your neck, and on the right side here, this is going to be the skin of the back of your neck. Let's take a look at these anatomic landmarks one by one as well. The disc, which is the cushion material that's between the vertebral bodies, is highlighted here in blue. The vertebral bodies are going to be these bones on either side of the disc. Next, we have the vertebral artery, which helps take blood from your heart all the way up to your brain. It's very important for us to know where these structures are during surgeries. The nerve roots are highlighted here in green, and you can also see how the nerve roots come out in between two vertebrae. So you have this nerve root here that's coming out between this vertebrae and this vertebrae, and then you have this nerve root here that's coming out in between this one and this one above that's slightly obscured. The spinous processes are highlighted here in yellow, and you can see how they do protrude out a little bit. So if you are trying to touch the back of your neck from this side, this is going to be the first bone that you're going to feel. Lastly, we have the facet joint highlighted here in purple. This is the connection between both vertebrae. So if you have a vertebrae here and here, this purple line is going to be the joint that is between these two vertebrae. These joints allow your neck to have motion in many different planes. This is going to be a view from the top. So you have the skin of your back of the neck up top here, and then the front of your neck down at the bottom. Going through these structures one by one, we find the disc highlighted here in blue. This is a cushion material that is between your vertebrae that helps keep your range of motion. The vertebral artery is highlighted here in black. It's very important for us to know where these are during surgery to help keep you safe. The nerve roots are highlighted here in green, coming off of the spinal cord, which is in purple. Lastly, protecting the spinal cord is going to be the spinous process and lamina together. And again, you can see that if you're touching the back of your neck, this tip of the spinous process is going to be the first thing that you feel. Now let's see what happens if we take a cut right through the middle of your neck. This is the view that we get. For orientation purposes, the left side of the screen is going to be where the front of your neck is, and the right side of the screen is going to be where the back of your neck is. The spinous process and lamina is highlighted here with my laser pointer, and the vertebrae 
are here in white on either side of a disc which is here in red. The spinal cord is in the middle. And you can see that there is space between the vertebrae and the spinal cord, as well as the spinal cord and the lamina and spinous process here highlighted in white. A degenerative cervical spine looks significantly different than the last view we just saw. Let's take a look at some of those features. In a degenerative cervical spine, you see disc height loss. So in here, the red, the disc, isn't as tall as it once was. As a result of the disc height loss and degeneration, you start to see bone spurs form. The bone spurs form in the front of the vertebral bodies, as well as in the back of the vertebral bodies. You can see though, as a result of the bone spurs forming into the back of the vertebral body, it starts to compress the spinal cord a little bit. That leads us to disc bulging, which also occurs as a result of degeneration. So, in total, you have the bone spurs, the decreased height, and the disc bulging all contributing to spinal cord compression in this example. Let's take a look at the degenerative cervical vertebrae from the top view. Now, to remind you, the disc is highlighted here in red, spinal cord in yellow, and the spinal canal, or the space for the spinal cord, is in this dark area here. This spinal cord has significant space in this example. But look what happens once the spine becomes degenerative. You start seeing some changes. The disc starts bulging a lot more. You start seeing bone spurs form, and as a result of the disc height loss, bone spurs and disc bulging, you have the spinal cord have significantly less space than before. You can tell that that rim that was around here for the spinal canal isn't present. The reason why it's not present is because of the disc bulging and bone spurs that have occurred as a result of disc degeneration. So a degenerative spine can lead to spinal canal narrowing, which we call spinal stenosis. Let's take a look at these two examples below. On the left side, you have your normal cervical spine. You don't have any degeneration here. And look how big the spinal canal is. The spinal canal is measured from the disc space out to the very beginning of the spinous process and lamina. It looks quite large here. However, in a degenerative spine, when you do see some of that disc bulging and bone spurs, look at what the size of the canal should be and what it actually is. So this is how big this canal should be when compared to the normal view. But you can tell that the canal size is actually only from this disc space to about here. So you're missing this whole amount of space for your spinal cord. It is very compressed in this example. Let's take a look at what the normal spine looks like from the top view. Highlighted here in blue is the size of the spinal canal. Again, extending from the very beginning or end of the disc all the way to where the spinous process is. Now let's see what happens in a degenerative spine. Because of disc bulging and bone spurs secondary to disc degeneration, you can see that the size of the canal is much smaller than it would have been if it was a normal spine. You have a space problem. You do not have enough space in your spinal canal for your spinal cord. And we're able to see that here in this degenerative spine. Because of the bone spurs and disc bulging, you have spinal cord compression. As a result of that, the spinal canal is quite small. But the goal of our surgery is to create a larger spinal canal. Remember, this is a structural problem. You simply do not have enough space for your spinal cord. So we have to make more space. And this is how we do it. We remove the bones that were in the back completely, and then we stabilize the spine. Now you can see there's no more compression of the spinal cord, and the canal is as large as it needs to be. Let's talk about how we do this step by step. Let's go back and review our anatomy just briefly. This view that you're seeing here is from the back of the neck. To remind you, the top is going to be where your head is, and your feet are going to be at the bottom. What we want to know is where our spinal canal is. The spinal canal is between the lateral masses. The lateral masses are highlighted here in green. In between this area, underneath this white bone here is going to be the spinal canal. Over where the green is, is going to be bone where we're going to anchor our screws in place. So what our goal is, is we're going to be able to remove this white piece of bone here between the green, which will then expose our spinal cord. Now that we know the borders of the spinal canal, we have to find a way to remove that bone. The removal of the bone where the spinal canal is, is called a laminectomy. So what we do is I've drawn lines here to show you where those borders of the spinal canal are. 
Then we take a high speed burr and we're able to drill through the bone on all sides to the spinal cord, which then allows us to remove those bones, which is the laminectomy. Let's take a look at this from the top view. To remind you again, the skin of the back of your neck is going to be up top here, and the front of your neck is going to be here at the bottom. What we're going to do is we're going to have to cut troughs within both the left and the right side of this bone here, this triangle bone called the spinous process and lamina. What you'll see is that these are going to be our troughs. You can see that this trough in black goes from here all the way down to the spinal cord and from up top here all the way down to the spinal cord. This area between the black is going to be the spinal canal. The areas outside of where these troughs are is the lateral mass or the area where we secure our screws. The reason why we can secure our screws here is because you can see it's made of completely bone. So let's go ahead and create our bone cuts now. And it goes all the way through on both sides. After we've cut completely through the bone on both the left and right side, we need to find a way to try to lift that bone up to create more space for the spinal cord. So we'll take this instrument called a curette and try to fit it between one of the troughs on either the left or right side. Once we're able to do that, we're able to slowly lift up the lamina and spinous process together as one unit. This creates a ton of space for the spinal canal and spinal cord now. You can also see that these areas here that are all bone on the left and right sides, these are the lateral masses. Again, these are the areas where we anchor our screws. Now that there's no compression on the back of the spinal cord, the spinal cord is able to drift backwards off of the bone spurs and disc bulging. You can see this here manifested with the white on all sides. Now that you're able to see white in between the spinal cord and the disc and bone spurs, you know that the spinal cord is decompressed and it no longer has significant compression. Here's a side view to give you another view of what we just did. This is going to be where the base of your skull is and brain will be up here, and then your feet will be down at the bottom. The left side of the screen is going to be the front of your neck, and the right side of the screen is going into the back of your neck. We're doing surgery through the back of the neck here, and we're targeting these bones right here. These are the bones that we're trying to remove and that we did remove on the last slide. So before it looks like this, and then after it looks like this. You can see that there's no more spinous process or lamina here because it's been removed. And now you can see a spinal cord underneath because there's no more compression. With the laminectomy complete, the spinal cord is now decompressed. Now we must fuse the bones together with rods and screws in the areas where the laminectomy was performed to stabilize and realign the vertebrae. To show you the second part of this procedure, let's review again this back view. The spinal canal is between the lateral masses, highlighted here in green, and then black indicates where the spinal canal is. When we made our troughs and when we removed the bone, we removed the bone between the black lines here. And here the laminectomy is complete. Now there's nothing touching the spinal cord anymore. That part of the procedure was the laminectomy. Now we have to complete the fusion. To place the screws, imagine dividing each lateral mass into four quadrants, identifying the middle, which we have done here. We then identify the inside lower quadrant, and that's going to be the start point for each of our screws. We then take our drill, and then drill a small pilot hole where the red dots are. We then insert our screws, utilizing that up and out trajectory. So let's see what it would look like on the right side here from the side view. So when we're inserting those screws, they go in this up and out direction. These screws are all lined up perfectly within the lateral masses here. And then this is what it would look like on the direct back view. It would be a little bit into that lower inside quadrant on each side. So we'll do it on this side and then on the other side. Next, we place rods and the locking caps which lock on to the screws. This is highlighted here, and then our locking caps go on, locking the screws into the rod completely. This completes our fusion. To remind you of what everything looked like before surgery, look at the amount of compression of this spinal cord. There's disc and bone spur touching the spinal cord, and nowhere really for the spinal cord to escape out the back because of this big bone here. However, after surgery, that bone is removed, 
and when that bone is removed, the spinal cord is able to drift backwards off of the disc and bone spurs here. This is the laminectomy portion of the surgery, and then you have the screws here in this up and out trajectory that is now holding everything in place and stabilizing the reconstruction. Here is the back view before surgery. And then after the laminectomy infusion is complete, you can see the massive difference. You see that there is no more bone in between the areas where the spinal canal is, and you see the lateral masses, which are our target areas for our screws. Each one of them has a screw, and you have rods connecting all the screws on the left and right sides. That is the fusion part of this procedure. And that's how I step-by-step -step perform a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion. Let's cover some common questions that I hear. What are the risks of this procedure? Neck pain is very common following this procedure. Think about it this way. We have to make an incision about this big in the back of your neck. And in the process of trying to get to your bones, we do have to move some of those muscles off to the side. In the process of doing that, that can cause some neck muscle damage. We do sew those muscles together afterwards, but it does take time for those muscles to heal. The neck pain can last for up to a month, but can rarely be long term. Infection can occur as well. Because we're making an incision in the back of your neck, we do have to have those muscles heal back together. Occasionally from time to time, because of the location of the incision, patients may have wound problems or get an infection. This is exceedingly rare though. Less than 2% of patients do have these problems. However, patients that are at increased risk for this have obesity, diabetes, or are smokers. We try to counsel patients prior to undergoing this procedure if they're one of those three about these risks. Nerve injury is also a risk. Your spinal cord has been compressed for a very long time, and as a result of your spinal cord being compressed a long time, the nerve roots which extend off from the spinal cord have also been shortened a bit. In the course of about a couple hours, we're able to do this procedure and your spinal cord actually drifts backwards off of any of the compression that it may be having. As a result of this, what can happen is those nerve roots, which are very, very short to begin with because it's been compressed for so long, can be stretched temporarily. As a result of this, you may experience weakness lifting your arm out like this or doing a bicep curl. That can last for about a year, but tends to come back with physical therapy. It is rare that this occurs though. Less than 8% of patients have this occur. This could occur up to three days after surgery though because of the stretch. Less than 1% of the time, in the process of making those bone cuts with our high-speed burr, we may get a small hole within the fluid-filled sac which holds the spinal cord. That causes a spinal fluid leak. If that occurs, I attempt to fix it right there, but we may have to keep you in the hospital another day or two to ensure it's not continuing to leak. The last risk that I worry about is non-union. This means that the bones didn't heal together. If this occurs, you may need an additional procedure. Patients who are at risk for not healing are generally those who have soft bone, are smokers, or are poorly controlled diabetics. If you're one of these, we do talk to you beforehand about these risks. What's the recovery like following this procedure? Generally, patients are staying one to two nights in the hospital and then going home with family assistance. You will have neck pain for at least a month though because of the dissection that's needed to complete the procedure. This is a stiff soreness type pain that extends from the base of your neck into the top of the shoulders. This does tend to improve after about a month, but a lot of patients sometimes do have some amount of long-term pain just as a result of us having to go through the back of the neck. One thing that I tell all my patients following surgery is that the goal of the surgery is to halt progression of your symptoms. We do not want you worsening from the time that you've had surgery to any other point in your life. By taking the pressure off of the spinal cord, we then allow your body time to start healing things. Any improvement that you may experience is a bonus, but only about a third of patients end up seeing improvements. The other thing I tell patients is that the nerves take about one year to go through the healing process. The spinal cord can take even longer at times, so there's no snap judgments on this surgery, but how you feel at one year to two years is going to be how you're going to feel long term. Give your body time to heal. The spinal cord and nerves have been compressed for a very long time and they need time to recover. What can I do post-op? 
it's okay for you to remove the bandage that you leave the hospital with in three days, and then you can shower normally without the bandage. All of your stitches are going to be on the inside and covered with butterfly strips unless you are stapled. If you have staples in place, you can also shower after three days. Simply let soap and water run down the back of your neck and pat it dry afterwards, putting a new bandage over the top for about the first week or two until we know that the incision has started to heal. The other thing is we want no reaching or lifting greater than 20 pounds for about six weeks. The reason why we say no reaching far out in front of you or reaching far above your head is because your muscles in your neck are held tightly together with stitches as they heal. The healing process for the muscles takes about six weeks. If you're reaching frequently far in front of you or high above your head, you may be slowing the recovery and healing of the neck muscles. Following six weeks though, you have no restrictions and then we can start physical therapy. It is okay for you to walk as much as you want. We want you to be walking because then you can start working on some of those balance and coordination issues which have likely been giving you a problem as time has been going on. Following surgery, we do place you in a hard collar. The reason for this is that we want your bones to remain still while they start the healing process. After six weeks though, we can place you in a soft collar to help your muscles get used to moving around a little bit. You should wear the hard collar at all times except for eating and showering. From a pain management perspective, I don't want you taking any anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories actually decrease fusion rate. Anti-inflammatories include medications like ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Advil, Mobic, or Celebrex. In its place though, you can take Tylenol 1000 milligrams three times a day. I usually say take it with breakfast, lunch, and dinner because it does give you some background pain relief so you don't have to take as much prescription pain medication or muscle relaxer, which we will provide you with after surgery. Generally after six weeks though, most patients are off of all narcotics. Hope these answered your questions. And there you have it, the posterior cervical laminectomy infusion. Hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of the anatomy of the neck, step-by-step -step how I perform the procedure, and what to expect postoperatively. If you're curious about the conditions that can be treated with this particular procedure, see the links below. To have a consultation with me regarding your spine, you can find our office phone number in the description below if you're on YouTube, or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. You can also find me on these other platforms. And if you're on YouTube, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about future educational videos such as this one. Take care.